Christ is risen. Hi, everyone. My name is Dahlia Fan. I was born and raised in the USA, and now I live here in Zambia, a small southern Africa country. And we've been living here, my husband and with my two wonderful kids, for almost 13 years. We felt and heard the calling in our lives from God um, to come here to Africa and to live here and to serve the poor and to just help the most vulnerable. But you know, the calling in my life happened way before I heard, you know, this actual call to come to Africa. There was something always, even when I was younger, I felt God always calling me and giving me a desire to help the most vulnerable, to be a voice for those that have no voice. The only thing is, I just didn't know how to fulfill that call. How do I do it? What do I do? And instead, I just really, really struggled. And I tried to find my purpose um, maybe through studying, studying human rights. So like I went to law school and I studied international human rights and I was trying to figure out how can I help people? How can I give people their rights? And then I couldn't find it in that. And I tried to, you know, maybe make friends or, or find my value, find, find what I was looking for, find that calling in social life or in other things. And nothing was really fulfilling the call except for one thing. And that's when I found out who I really belong to. In Song of Songs, chapter six, verse three, it says, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He who shepherds his sheep among the lilies. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Who is my beloved? Of course, it's Christ. When I found out that I belong to Christ, he belongs to me, and that is where I can really fulfill my calling. Knowing who I belong to, and knowing that I belong to someone even greater than myself, and that stops, when I stopped looking at just myself only, I was able to truly fulfill my calling. And how to find him, it says, he who shepherds his sheep among the lilies, where do I find him? In the garden, shepherding his sheep. So to find him, I have to go and do his work, caring for his sheep with him. And the garden is many places. It could be our churches, our families, our communities, our neighborhoods, even here in Africa. There's a beautiful quote by St. Augustine that sums a lot of things up. It says, to fall in love with God is the greatest romance, to seek him the greatest adventure, to find him the greatest human achievement. So I'll say it again, to fall in love with God is the greatest romance, to seek him the greatest adventure, to find him the greatest human achievement. It was when I fell in love with God that I was willing to follow him to the ends of the earth, even to come here to Africa. It was, that was when I could really live out my calling. And it can be for you as well. If, when you really fall in love with God, you will hear his calling in your life. Maybe it's not to move to Africa, but maybe it's to reach out to a, a youth in your, in your church group that's feeling left out, or it's to obey your parents, or it's to forgive someone that's really hurt you. There's a lot of things God is calling us to do, but we won't hear that call until we truly fall in love with him, until we realize that we belong to him and he belongs to us. And you don't have to wait to, until you grow up to be a missionary. You can fulfill that calling of a missionary today, even now. Um, there's tons of things you could do in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your sports teams, in your communities. You can create awareness about the environment. You could start a fundraiser. You can even, since we're on lockdown now, you can even be a missionary in social media. Write verses, encourage people. The, the world could really use that right now. Post about what you're learning today in Teams Day. Um, don't be afraid to show people who you are. That's a missionary, to be that light that the world needs. Don't be afraid to show people who you really are and who you belong to. When you fall in love with God, truly fall in love with him, then you really you can fulfill that call that God has for you and the call that God has for me. He is calling each and every one of us. And now you have to be courageous. We had to take a step of courage to come here to Africa. And it wasn't easy to leave our family, to leave our friends, to leave our comforts, what we know, um, to be even mocked or to be made fun of. And 
we all have to take that courageous step of faith and a courageous step to fulfill the calling that God has for me and God has for you. There's a really funny movie that my kids love. It's called Evan Almighty. And in the movie, there is a scene at the, near the end where the, the journalist asks the actor, says, why do you think that you are called? And then the guy answers, he says, we're all called, but it's up to us, each one of us, to respond. So it's up to each one of us to respond. We're all called, and I pray with all my heart that you fall in love with God, seek him, find him, and be courageous to obey that calling. Thank you so very much. We thank Dalia for sending in that um, beautiful video message for all of us. So, guys, just to, to tell you something, Mark here, the, our host, has, uh, this is one of his books, if you can see it. Of course, it's upside down. It's, it's inverted. It's Joe Fortin's. It's uh, one of our books in, uh, in, uh, in the monastery here. Um, uh, it's a Bible study on the book of Job for teenagers, obviously. So, we have, a lot of, uh, we have another one for, um, actually, I have another one for liturgy. So, if you want to understand the liturgy more, there's another one for the liturgy for teens. We have... Uh, there's a whole list of them yeah, in, uh, in, and on the Incarnation, another book by St. Athanasius, if you've, uh, if you've seen it before, uh, heard about it. Um, it talks about why uh, Jesus Christ became man, and um, it's very interesting, and how, the, how does it affect me in my life? Nina, what have you been doing this, during this time? Um, I've been talking to my friends and playing and going on the church meetings. Good stuff. You enjoying it? Yeah. Sayyidna's asking, have you read any of uh, these books that we were just talking about? No. You don't know what you're missing, man. <laughs> no problem, Mina. No problems at all. How you been? Where, where are you from, uh, Dimitri? I'm from uh, New Jersey, and I go to St. Anthony Cathedral Orthodox Church in Medford, New Jersey. Nice, nice. Very nice. How old are you, Anthony? Uh, well, um, actually, I'm 18 years old. Um, nice. And my favorite or favorite thing about me or favorite sport to do, I like um, running. So I actually, I ran six miles um, this past Saturday. So I tried to keep fit. So Very good. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Lucy, Lucy Yakub, Los Angeles. How are you, Lucy? I am doing well. How are you? I don't, have to, I don't have to ask you what you do because I can see a lot of beautiful drawings behind you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I draw <laughs> and I do calligraphy as well, yeah. And you do what, sorry? Calligraphy. No way. Wow, yeah, yeah. I, can see, I can see some behind you, yes. It looks awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm from Los uh, Angeles. And... Um, nice. I picked up was it's a kind of a funny story actually none of the deacons yes. at my church were willing to teach me Pekethronos so I taught myself Pekethronos over the point well done well done excellent excellent Thank yeah, you. I, I guess this, and I guess this year you had the chance to say it all on your own you didn't, no one could stop you huh I mean I said it with the deacons so if that counts yeah <laughs> that's awesome very nice the hardest Thank you, Abuna. hello hello Matthew Ibrahim how are you Matthew I'm doing good. Thank uh, you. Well, how old are you, Matthew? Um, 13. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. Good stuff. Well, mm -hmm. very good. Uh, is it uh, summer over there now? Um, spring, kind of. Not really summer, but it is sunny out. It's more spring than summer. Nice. So, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. So what do you do, uh, do, you, what do, you do in your spare time, uh, Matthew? Um, I mostly like play basketball in my front in my front yard. I got a hoop and I usually shoot some shots when I'm done my homework. Sometimes I work nice. out. Sometimes I listen to audiobooks. I don't like reading, so I just listen to audiobooks. I don't like reading, honestly. Nice, nice. Which uh, which which I'm books have you listened to recently? Guy. Mostly Harry Potter. Just I oh, just pick good. anything. Very mostly nice. Harry Potter. Yeah, so audiobooks or movies? <laughs> Uh, uh, both, both, but, uh, but I can only get well, audiobooks right now. Fair enough, fair enough. Well done, well done. Very nice, 
You know, I, I personally like audio books too. So whenever I get my chance to, I get a chance to actually listen to a book rather than read it, I, I usually take it. You know, it's, it's a good option. It's always yeah, a good option. Yes, yeah, like, I honestly don't want to read. I, I like to listen to it because I like the narration. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're good. Yeah, sometimes they're very good. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much, Matthew. God bless you. Ah, there you go, Monica. How are you, Monica? Howard? Good, how are you? Who are you from, Monica? I'm from Canada, and I attend at nice. um, Mary and St. Athanasius. St. Mary and St. Athanasius, you said? Yes. Nice, nice. Uh, how old are you, Monica? 15. Good stuff. And what have you been doing this, uh, during this time? I've been trying to keep myself occupied with like baking, um, spending time with my family, and obviously school it takes a lot of time too. Nice, nice. What have you been baking? Cake. I love cake. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I love cake too, but you know it's a bit, uh, bit of a distance. Can you can do you do Uber Eats? Sorry. Do you do Uber Eats? No. <laughs> no. Oh man. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. All right, fair enough. Deal. <laughs> um, nice, nice. And what what else do you do? You said you said spending time with the family. Do you do sports yeah. or reading or? Um, we just like I don't know, watch movies and stuff like that. Spend time with each other and catch up because, you know, it's a good opportunity. So do you get the time to do that more now than you did before? Definitely. No, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Very nice. It's good. It's good. You guys have been so. It's been a blessing in disguise, huh? Like it, it is. Has it has been uh, hard on a lot of people, but uh, I guess through hard times we do the, the most of it, and we learn heaps. So we come out um, learning a lot more. Yeah, make the best out of it. Is that your experience? Yeah. Well done. Well done. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. God bless. You. Yes, Mark. It's your turn. Thanks, guys. Um, so we'll move on now to our next segment. Our next speaker is, uh, is really, really exciting. If you don't know his name already, um, you probably do. But if you don't, um, you definitely will after today. Um, he serves in St. Timothy and St. Athanasius Church in Arlington, Virginia, which is a missionary church. Um, this is also very, very exciting for me. I consider myself like an unofficial disciple. Um, he's... Uh, basically got me through my teen years. So um, I'm just going to shamelessly plug. If any of you want to listen to any of his talks, there are hundreds of them on Upper Room Media. So I'm just going to plug that in there. Um, so just jump on Upper Room Media, which you can find on any app store or the Google Play store, and you can hear any of his talks. Um, and he's the author of this beautiful book titled Whatever God. So if you don't have this book, um, I highly recommend you get it. It's great. Um, and so, without further ado, we'll please welcome Father Anthony Messa from St. Timothy and St. Athanasius Church. Oh, we, we need to un oh, unmute you now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, first, um, Sayedna, for uh, having me here, and, and Abuna for inviting me. Thank you, Sayedna. Um, Please halil me, say it, absolve me, and absolve me, Abuna. Um, and thank you all so much for uh, giving me a chance to, to join you guys here. I guess if this is my spotlight, my name is Father Anthony. I'm from Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. I have not done any baking, but I have done a lot of eating during this time. Um, and um, I have learned uh, my children, and I have two children who are teenagers who are actually downstairs watching as I speak. Um, and we have learned uh, lots of new sports. Okay, that's what we kind of decided is we learned new sports. So um, we played a game called spike ball. I don't know if you ever heard of spike ball. Maybe it's an American thing. And then we played something we used to play when we were kids called badminton. I don't know if you guys have heard of badminton, that little birdie which you hit the little thing. So it's a great time to learn new sports, especially if you got good weather. Um, so again, thank you for so much for inviting me. Um, I was uh, very excited when uh, Abuna Anthony reached out to me to talk about the life of St. Anthony. And obviously that name is a special name to me. And believe it or not, um, that actually the, the book, The Life of Anthony, is actually the book that um, I read this past Lent. Um, it just, it, God put it in front of me and I happened to be reading it. So really it was perfect timing. And what I'm gonna speak to you guys about here today is about um, quiet time and more the life of solitude 
in the life of St. Anthony and how kind of it applies to us. But before I do that, let me ask you a question. St. Anthony, okay, before he became a great saint, okay, but like the St. Anthony, you know, at the very end of his life. But let's go to St. Anthony who left his life here as a young man to go into the wilderness, spend time in prayer, spend time in solitude, spend time in reflection, word of God, all the great things that uh, Abuna spoke to us about earlier. If you were to rank St. Anthony's spiritual life, okay, and we, we don't, this is not something that we believe in, but just this is sometimes how we act. Like if you give him a grade, there's no grades, okay? God doesn't give it that way. But in our minds, there's grades, okay? In our minds, there's like, you know, good, better, and best, you know? So there's like, you know, like the, the saints, you know, and then of course, you know, um, you know, the Pope is up here. And then of course, the Pope and the bishops, of course, all the bishops and the fathers, okay? Those guys are at the top, okay? And then there's, you know, we kind of have this ranking system. Then there's like, you know, the kid in my chemistry class, and then there's that naughty kid across the street, and we kind of have a ranking system. St. Anthony, if you were to give him a grade, okay, we were, I, there's a lot of people, so you don't need to answer this, okay, but just in your mind. Would you say that he was good? Would you say he was average, below average, or above average? I think most of us would agree that St. Anthony was above average. And, and then he went to the desert, and he became even more above average. Then he became even more above average and more above average. And you get to a certain point that you would say, okay, St. Anthony, like, you're good now. Like, you're good. You've done what you need to do. Like, you're good. But St. Anthony's life, as well as the life of all the saints, reveals to us something very important in Christianity. This is very, very, very important. And this is not how we usually think. This is the opposite of how we think. We go to school and we get grades. A is better than B, B is better than C, C is better than D. That's how we think. A, B, C, and D. A 90 is better than an 80, 80 is better than a 70, 70 is better than 60. If you get below a 60, don't come home, okay, because you might not get let into the house, okay? That's how we think. But is that how God thinks? I don't think so. Because when Jesus came, Jesus told the people, and he revealed in his actions, that it's not the way that they look at people. Okay, there's a verse in the Old Testament that says, God does not see as man sees. Okay, man sees the outside, but God sees inside. So like in the Old Testament, in the Pharisees and, the, and kind of the Jewish system was they had certain people who were good, okay? And those were called the righteous. And then they had people called sinners. And sinners were bad. And then they had people even below sinners called the tax collectors. And they were really bad. But Jesus did weird things. Jesus went and hung out with the sinners. And they said, Jesus, don't you understand? Like they're sinners. We're the, excuse me, we're the righteous. Why are you with sinners? Okay, they had things called clean and unclean. So lepers were unclean. You're not supposed to touch them. Jesus would go and touch them. Jesus would do weird things like this, and he showed them that even the people who were low, the sinners, okay, like for example, the story we all know, the prodigal son. He showed them that even the prodigal son, very, very low, very, very bad, like F student, that he can be very good. And Jesus can, and the Father can accept him. He showed us, like Abuna spoke about earlier, like someone like Saul, okay, St. Paul, Saul, before he got converted, who was a murderer, can be like the greatest missionary. So what that teaches us is an important lesson. Listen carefully to this important lesson. The spiritual life, even though we think the opposite, the spiritual life is not good and bad. That's how we think. Either you're good or you're bad. That's not, that's not how God looks at it. How God looks at it is growth and progress. Okay, so I'll give you a couple analogies. Think of it one analogy of climbing a mountain. Okay, the goal of our life is to climb this mountain and to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. That's not an easy goal, and none of us is there yet. And we're all at different places on the mountain. Some people are at step four, some people are at step 17, some people are at step 300. It doesn't matter. Let's say it's a thousand steps. All of us are different places. There's no such thing as good and bad. What there is is people that are moving up and people that are moving down. Okay, so think of it this way. Let's say you have a person, okay, and again, I'm making up the numbers, but let's say a person who's at level 800. Let's say there's a 1,000 steps, who's at level 800, but is moving down. And then let's say you have a person who's at level 100, but who's moving up. Which of them in God's eyes is doing better? The one who's moving up. But you would say, but still, the 800 who went to 700 is still better than the 100 who went to 200. Not in God's eyes, because it's not about where you are, it's about where you're moving. 
Another example would be like physical exercise, the okay, exercise of the body. Exercise of the body is a good analogy for exercise of the soul and the spirit. No matter how good a shape you're in, okay, right here, if I wasn't wearing to show you the guns, no matter how good a shape you're in, one guy said he was um, um, getting in shape. And I think there was one guy who I saw in the gallery view who wasn't wearing a shirt. Okay, I don't know if that was my imagination or not. Okay, but please hide those, hide those guns. Okay, this is a, a children's program here. Okay, no matter how good a shape you're in, you can get better. And no matter how bad a shape you're in, you can get worse. So it doesn't matter where you are. What matters is let's all go this way. Let's all go forward. Let's all go up the mountain. Let's all get in better shape. Why that's an important concept? Because what we're going to talk about right now is we're going to talk about quiet time. Now, quiet time has different names. Some people call it quiet time. Some people call it meditation. Some people call it solitude. Some people just call it prayer and reading your Bible. I don't care what you call it. What I care about is what it is. And what it is, okay, there's two verses in Matthew chapter 6 that reveal to us what it is. Verses when Jesus said that when you pray, you go to your room, you close the door, and you pray to your father who's in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Okay, that's what Jesus said. To me, that's one of the core verses of Christianity. Christianity at its core is what happens inside this door, not what happens outside. That's not how we think. We think if you're a Christian, then outside you, um, you go to church, which is good. And we think that outside you serve in, the, in, in your community. Or we think that outside you don't say these words. Or outside you don't do these things. All that stuff is great. But what I'm saying is the core, the essence of Christianity, is what happens on the inside of this door, not what happens on the outside. When no one is around. When no one is looking. It's between me and my father. And with that, the second verse, which comes right after Matthew 6, 6, a couple verses later, is when Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Okay, you remember that the disciples came to him, and they said, we read this verse at the beginning of, of Lent, okay, which seems like a million years ago, but it actually wasn't. It's just like two months ago. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And notice, they said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And his response to them, we may not think much of it because we've read it so many times, we've said it. He said to them, in this manner, therefore, pray. And he said to them two words, our father. And I'm telling you, okay, we've read this so many times. We're just like, our father in heaven. And that's often how we pray, right? Don't we hit this every, how are we going to say? Our father in heaven. Okay, but I promise you, when Jesus said our father to uh, guys like James and John and Peter, okay, and, and those guys, they did not say our father in heaven. Jesus said, this is how you pray. You pray and say, our father. And they said, excuse me? If, I beg your pardon? And they said, stop. Whoa, 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 whoa. Our who? Our father? Our father, in case how we translate it in English, but um, the, the, the word in Aramaic is Ava. Okay? And Ava is much softer than father. Father's like, like my kids don't call me father. Like father's like, it's not father. Another word, the word that we get in English from Ava, if you want to guess what it is, okay, it's actually another four-letter word that we get from Ava, which is Papa. Okay, that's why we say Papa, Ava, Tawadros. Okay, Papa, Papa. Jesus said, call God Papa. And I'm telling you, the disciples were like, what? Papa? Like, no, no, no. Before Jesus, they didn't call God Papa. They didn't call God Ava. They called God Master. They called God Lord, Almighty, the Maker, the Creator, the Pantocrator. And God for them was something big, 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 huge that you could never say Papa to. But Jesus changed everything. In one sentence, he said, call God Father, our Father, Papa. So what this reveals to us is that God wants to have a relationship with us, a personal, intimate, Father, Son, Papa relationship. You know, in the entire Old Testament, the word father is used to refer to God this many times. Seven times in the whole Old Testament, God is called father. Seven times. You know, in the Gospels, 150 times the word father is used to refer to God. And in this chapter alone, Jesus says it seven times. Seven times in the whole Old Testament. Old Testament, three quarters of your Bible. 150 times in the Gospels, seven times in this chapter. Because what that shows is Jesus is trying to show the people, show his disciples, that the most important thing that you understand 
is that I'm not just your Lord. I'm not just your master. I'm not just your maker. I'm not just your creator. I'm not someone you pray to on Sundays. I want to be your daddy. I want to be your father. I want to have an intimate relationship with each one of you. And that's what quiet time is all about. We're going to talk right now. I'm going to go quickly over four tips. Okay, and I call them tips. I don't call them rules. There's no rules for quiet time. Just like you can't tell me there's rules to spend time with my daughter who's downstairs. There's no rules. Okay, the only rule is that we have a, a, a good quality time. That's the only rule. And I'm going to give you some tips that'll help you, hopefully. Okay, but they're not rules. Meaning that if you have a slightly different way, or another priest has a different way, or a bishop tells you something different, it's not rules. This is just simply what I found works for me. So if you're like me and it works for you, that's great. If you're a little bit different, okay, and you have a different system, what matters is the end result, the time with my papa, my ava, which is my father in heaven, okay? Four quick rules, okay? And I'll go through them real quick. And at the, I know there's a Q&A time at the end, so I'm happy to answer whatever questions. Number one, set a specific time. Set a specific time. Anything that's important in life has a time. If you say, I have an exam on Tuesday, I know we're not in school right now, but let's say you had school, would the teacher say, yeah, come in whenever you want, okay? Or there's a, there's a football game or a, a football match or whatever okay, country you're from here, okay? And, and you, you know what time it is. It's at eight o'clock, okay? I don't know if you guys are big basketball fans in, in, in Australia or not. I know a lot of people here from the States, Okay, there's a documentary on ESPN about Michael Jordan called The Last Dance and his final year in Chicago, which you young kids, you're like, what's a Michael Jordan? We only know LeBron James, but Michael Jordan is the real deal. There's no such thing as LeBron James. Okay, LeBron James, okay? I could take LeBron James if they give me a chance, all right? But, but it is this thing, and I tell you exactly what it is. It's Sunday night at nine o'clock, and we count the minutes. We count the minutes until this thing comes on. So anything that's important has a time, but let me ask you. You have a million hours a day now because of coronavirus. When are you going to spend time with God? Don't tell me when I have free time. Don't tell me later. Don't tell me eventually. I'm telling you, eventually will never, ever happen. I promise you. Eventually will never happen. Have a set time. Eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, there's no eight. Sorry, you guys are. <laughs> you know, when you first wake up, 1130 in the morning. Look at my kids, okay? When you first get up at 1130, okay? I don't care what time, okay? Now, me personally, I'm a morning guy. So I like to do it in the morning. There's no rule that says it has to be the morning, but I personally, I think morning is better. And the reason why, if I'm gonna go fight a battle, I want to warm up in the morning before the battle. I wanna get my sword before the battle. I wanna eat a good healthy meal before the battle. Well, the world is like, the day is like a battle. I need patience, okay, I need wisdom. I need so many things. So I wanna get that in the morning so that I can use it the rest of the day. And oftentimes, what I found is when I go to God in the morning, he'll give me a verse, okay? And he'll give me something that I need in that time. And then later on, ah, that's exactly that verse I needed for this. Or so-and-so called me and needed a verse, and I say, oh, this is the verse I read in my quiet time this morning. So set a specific time. I don't care what the time is, but you should have it set. And it should be pretty much the same every day, at least five days a week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday should be the same. Saturdays can be off, okay, and Sundays hopefully we go to church. Obviously, we don't go now, but at least we do something special with our church, okay? Set a time. Number two, set a place. Choose a specific place. Where are you going to do your quiet time? Don't tell me that you're going to do it. Okay, this is what I used to do for so many years. I want to do the quiet time where I'm comfortable so I don't, um, so I can stay as long as I want. So I'm going to do it in my bed, okay, under the covers so that, you know what, so that I can just you know, be really, yeah. no, 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 that's not a good place, okay, set a specific place, you should have a place, okay, I don't know if you guys did this, okay, what I encourage our congregation to do for Holy Week, as we were doing all the services, and still now, is have an altar in your home, I said everyone, like, check is, we, we turned my house, we don't have a church, we rent space, so we took all the furniture out my living room, okay, and we set up an altar, and we set up icons, and that became our altar for the week, and I encourage everyone to have a little place, that's like a special place, that where it's not a place where you watch TV. You don't do quiet time in the same place that you watch TV. Again, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I'm saying it's not, hell, it's not the best option. It's not healthy, okay? Choose a specific place. Oh, and um, <laughs> the importance of the specific place, okay? Um, when, when, okay, the whole idea of time with God, quiet time is kind of like a date with God, spending time with God, quality time. When me and my wife go out to dinner, 
which is very rare, but when we do go out to dinner, she is very smart and she realized something very early on when we were dating. We would sit down at a table, okay? She would notice, like if we sit at a restaurant and there's a TV with sports, because they all have sports on the TV. So she'd be sitting in front of me and my eyes would just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, so she realized the importance of the place. So what she would do as soon as we get to the restaurant, she finds the TV and then she sits in front of the TV. Okay. She makes me have my back. So it's a lot harder to do like that because the place matters. So set a specific time, set a specific place. Number three, have a plan. Don't just say, I'm going to go spend 20 minutes with God. Okay. What are you going to do during those 20 minutes? I'll figure it out when I get there. No, you're going to do nothing. You're going to go to sleep. You should have a plan. And let me give you what the plan should consist of. Okay. My plan, at least. There should be time for prayer. There should be time for Bible. And I believe there should be time for journaling. I'm a big fan of journaling and writing. Okay. So there should be a time. The order is up to you. Okay. Again, I'll tell you what works for me, but it can be up to you. I like to start with prayer. And prayer has two kinds of prayer. There's structured prayer, egbeya, formal, where I'm, I'm reciting the words. And then there's personal prayer. Okay. So you can start with one and then the other. It's up to you. Okay. You can ask your father a confession. He can guide you because everyone's in different places. But there should be prayer. There should be Bible. What are you reading in the Bible? Some people, okay, like to read the liturgical readings of the church. I think that's great. I'm actually doing that right now because we're not praying liturgy. So I'm reading the gospel of the day every day. In general, okay, I don't think this is the best plan year round because you'll only read a very limited piece of the Bible. Like it may be good, you know, like I said, during the Holy 50 or during Lent or is it, but in general, like if you, if you only do that, you'll never, there's certain epistles you never read. There's, you know, half the Old Testament you'll never read, okay? So try to keep, but have a plan, okay? And come up with that plan. And then, like I said, I'm a fan of journaling. If at the end of the time you read the Bible, you cannot write two bullet points, something that you, that, that you understood or that you were going to apply, then I don't think you got anything. You can't write two. Like if you can't at the end of this uh, night or day or whatever it is for you, if at the end of this three hours, you cannot write two bullet points, two things that you learned, then I'd say you didn't learn anything, okay? So specific time, specific place. Have a plan, specific plan. And then number four is kind of a general, be prepared for obstacles. Because I promise you, you set out to do quiet time, I promise you. All the power, listen carefully, all the power of hell will fight against you to spend that 20, 30 minutes with God in quiet time. All the power of hell and its angels. With that said, all the power of heaven with its angels will be fighting for you. The one thing that God wants is to spend time with us. The one thing that the devil wants is for us not to spend time with God. That's the war. And I promise you, there's going to be a million things. Believe me, when I go and stand up to pray, there's a million things. All of a sudden, okay, I stand up to pray and all of a sudden, I'm like, ah, I need a tissue, I need a tissue. So I go get a tissue and I come back to pray. I start to pray and, I sit, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. All right, so I go to the bathroom. Okay, and then I come back again. Then I... And then five minutes later, I got to go to the bathroom again, okay? You ever had that? Like you go to the bathroom 10 times during your prayer and the rest of the day don't go at all. So there's a million distractions that are going to try to fight you, okay? And Abuna, Anthony, okay, the monks, they can tell you about this and you can read about the life of St. Anthony, but it's real. But the power and the grace of God and the victory of God that Abuna spoke to us about earlier is just as real as well. So be prepared, okay? Because what I want to leave you with, okay, is a verse from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and, say it with your mouth, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So there's a door right there. Okay, this is the door to my room. All right, you see I got my little altar right here. Okay, I got my cross, my icon. I got my St. Timothy. I got St. Athanasius right there, but you can't see him. St. Mary down at the bottom. Every day, there's a war in this room. And Jesus is inviting me in and devil is trying to push me out every single day. And I'm telling you, 24 hours of the day, the 30 minutes that you spend with God, believe me, is the most important 30 minutes. If you got a good 30 minutes or whatever time, okay, like I don't want to tell you if it's an hour, if it's 15 minutes, again, I don't care about that. Those 15 minutes, if you are successful in those 15 minutes, the rest of your day, no matter what happens, will be great. The rest of your day will be a success. And I'm telling you the opposite. If you don't spend that 15 minutes with God and you don't have that time with God, and of course we all have days where we don't do it. So I don't want to make you feel guilty. 
but I'm saying in general, if I get straight A's and I'm captain of the basketball team and, you know, I have a big house and I get a job and I go to college and, 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 and I have no relationship with God, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Okay. So that's all I want to say. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. I'll leave you guys with that. And I think I went a little bit over my time, but hopefully not too much. Glory be to God forever. Thank you so much, Shabuna and Anthony. Um, we have so many questions flooding in. Um, thanks for the beautiful talk. Um, and also, uh, me and my brother-in-law have been arguing about MJ versus LeBron for a very long time. So I'm going to let him know that you are on my side. So thank you for that. Um, it's not my side and your side. It's the right side and the wrong side. That's it. There's only two. <laughs> I'll, I'll quote you. I'll quote you on that. <laughs> All right. Um, so the first question is, how do you suggest for teens struggling with the addiction of pornography and masturbation in such a diluted and desensitized earthly world? This was our top voted question on Slido. So we had yeah, to ask. So, so I, 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 obviously I get this question a lot, okay? And I wanna be honest and frank with you guys since you asked an honest question and say, it's not just teens, okay? So a lot of people struggle with this and I'll be honest, I'll tell you exactly what I tell my children of confession. I think, the key to the spiritual life. And actually, that's actually, what was Abuna, Abuna Elijah was his name, correct? Abuna Elijah, okay? Yeah. His talk was about spiritual warfare, but the way you worded it, it was about the victory, not about the warfare. I think the key to spiritual life is to focus on the positives, not the negatives. What I mean by that is, when my children at confession come to me and tell me, I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this and say all the bad stuff, I always ask, okay, tell me about the good stuff. Tell me, are you spending time in prayer? Are you spending time in your Bible? Are you serving? But tell me about the good stuff. Because think about it this way. Okay, let's again go to a sports analogy. If I do nothing wrong, but also nothing right, is that good or not good? That's not good. Like if I don't, let's say I'm married to my wife. Okay, I am married to my wife. Okay, I don't steal from her. And I don't get angry at her. And I don't uh, cheat on her. Does that mean we have a good marriage? No. Because, I mean, to have a good marriage, it has to be positive things that I'm doing. So I want to focus on the positives. Okay, again, back to the sports analogy. If I have a good defense and no one scores on me, but I never score on the other goal, I'm never going to win. I want to be on the offensive spiritually. So what I'm going to say to you who struggle with any sin, any addiction, fight on offense. The best defense is a good offense. If you don't want the other team to score on your goal, Go shoot the ball on their goal. Go kick the ball on that side. Go serve in the church. Go out there and spend time in prayer. Go read a spiritual book, okay? Uh, Bruno was asking who reads, and he was saying, he was saying but that's how we learn things. You got to learn how to read. You got to learn. I'm not saying you don't know how to read, but I'm saying you got to have the habit of reading. You got to have the habit of reading because this is how we don't know St. Anthony. But how can I be a disciple of St. Anthony? I read about his life, okay? St. Athanasius, who is, to me, is... I feel like I'm his disciple. Why? Because I read his books. And when you read someone's books, it's being discipled by him. Okay. And so many people out there say, Abuna, we feel like we know, like to me, we feel like we know you and we learn from you. I haven't met you. Okay. But if you read my book, you listen to my sermons, it's like sitting at someone's feet. So my answer to that question is don't focus on what the bad that you're doing. Focus on the positive. Okay. Go spend your time in positive things. Go have good fellowship. Again, after this whole thing passes. Okay. Spend time in good circles. And the more and more that you kick the ball on that side, okay, the less they'll score on your goal. I think of another example. In wartime, I want to protect it so that the other people don't capture my home base. Okay, that's true. But if you never attack, you're never going to win the war. You're going to be fighting the same battle for the rest of your life. Okay, you need to go out there and advance. And sometimes when you advance, you may lose and have some casualties. But that's the only way to win the war, okay? So I would say fight on the good side, fight on the positive side, and don't let the negative be the focus of your life. Thank you, Abuna. Um, another question is, sometimes I feel kind of awkward with my father of confession because I'm a girl. That, that's not me, by the way. That's um, the person <laughs> asking the question. How can I feel comfortable whilst opening up to Abuna? Um, obviously, it's, you know, I'll, I'll just say what I, what, from my experience. Um, I, I would tell, encourage this young lady, you know, maybe that's something you could ask your mother. Okay, she might be able to help you as a lady to a lady, or maybe your Sunday school teacher. But I'll tell you this, okay, as, as, kind of, as a priest, and I take lots of confessions, um, that 
when when a priest is is talking to anyone, a boy or a girl or anyone, okay, that's like a, a father son or a father daughter relationship, and you should feel comfortable in that same sense. Um, and what I would encourage you is is sometimes like the world puts thoughts in our head, you know, about you know funny things, and we read stuff online and things like that. Um, I, I I would talk to my mom about that or my Sunday school teacher and 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 see what how, maybe how she can help you a little bit. Okay, sorry I didn't give a great answer, but I'm not a girl, so I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Abuna. Um, maybe one more question. Uh, this one's asking: Are we all expected to reach spiritual perfection within our spiritual lives to attain salvation? Okay, so that's the beautiful thing: is that I'm going to say yes and no. Okay, yes and no. In the sense of Jesus told us, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So I am striving for perfection, knowing I'm never going to reach it. But not reaching it doesn't mean I'm not striving for it. Okay, and I'll give you an example. On my wedding day, let's go back to the marriage example. I want to say to my wife on my wedding day, I will love you for the rest of my life. And I will never think about anyone else other than you. And I will sacrifice myself for you. And I will always be unselfish for you. And I want to say all those nice things. Am I going to attain that? Probably not. Like I'll probably fall short at some point in time. But I'm not going to go in and say, you know what, sweetheart? My goal is 80%. That's my goal. My goal is to be, you're, you're on my mind 80% of the time. The other 20%, you know what I mean? You know, do, I do the best I can. My goal is to be faithful to you. 95% of the days is my goal is to be faithful 95% of the time. You don't go in and say that stuff. Okay, you go in and say 100%, okay? And you may fall short, but the beauty, you will fall short. But the beauty is God has already accommodated the falling of short because he's given us a sacrament of confession. So God says, strive for perfection. And we say, I'm gonna strive for perfection. And God says, you're gonna strive for it and you're gonna fall, but don't worry. I've created this thing called confession to forgive you and to lift you back up so you keep climbing up that mountain, okay? So it's kind of yes and kind of no. Thank you so much, Tabuna.